Hello, I'm Chris Wilson, and I'm going to be talking to you about using AAA 3D Engine technology to enhance 2D pixel style in our Unreal Engine 4 powered game, The Siege and the Sandfox. First, a little introduction um, to let you know who I am. So I'm the design director at Cardboard Sword. I've worked uh, in, tr in AAA for about eight years, uh, previously as a level designer before taking this role. Uh, I've been working fully independently with this team for about six months now. So what am I going to cover in this talk? Uh, well, I'm going to cover the decision-making process that led to us, a bunch of experienced AAA developers, deciding to uh, make something completely different and make a retro 2D game. Uh, our rationale for why we decided to use uh, an engine as feature-heavy as Unreal Engine 4 for this kind of game. And include all of our influences and explain how we took those techniques to uh, make our own pixel art. And finally, I want to put across to your argument why I think you should always be using the best tools available and a bit more clarification on what that means later. So firstly, a little history of our company. The two founders, Ollie Bennett and Aidan Howe, uh, met working at Double Eleven on Little Big Planet Vita, which hopefully some of you have played. Uh, now, Aidan, before that, had worked at Frontier Developments. Uh, now, I'm sure I'd be amazed if there's no one in this room who's worked at Frontier Developments in the past, because it seems pretty much everyone has either worked there or knows someone that works there. So Aidan met myself and the two artists while at Frontier. Uh, we all worked together on the ill-fated Outsider project. Following that project, uh, I moved on to Playground Games, and that's where I worked on the Forza Horizon series um, before basically our whole team assembled in late 2015. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, who cares? Why is that important? Well, I think it's important because it kind of frames how that we've all got lots of AAA experience. Uh, we're going to have a different perspective to those who are sort of fresh indies just rolling in. And we know really that when it comes down to it, it's all about the quality of the tools. If you don't have the experience working with a pipeline that really flows, then perhaps you just think that's how game development works. Uh, and likewise, we've got, you know, a lot of experience on what does work for game development and sadly several lifetimes worth of what doesn't work. So we're going to have a different perspective, which I'm going to share with you over the course of this. So we sat down, we're all independent now. Uh, you know, it's, it's equal parts daunting and exciting. We can do whatever we want. So what are we going to do? Now, naturally, it's always tempting to stick to what you know. And um, we could have done something a lot closer to home. But you know what? We all agreed, no, if we're ever going to take risks in our career, this is the time to do it. This is the time to do something exciting, something different that we perhaps don't know everything about. Um, none of us had ever done a 2D game before. So naturally, that seemed like a good fit, right? Because let's all try something. Let's try something new. We did also kind of feel that, you know what? 2D will be a little bit faster than 3D. Uh, the artists are well versed in 3D pipelines, the endless uh, different uh, maps, normal maps they need to generate, and textures, etc., and materials. They knew they wouldn't have to do this for 2D, so we assumed that would be faster. Um, obviously, we'll be challenging that later. Likewise with 2D animation, we felt that this would certainly be more approachable. Um, none of us are dedicated animators. None of us particularly want to be dedicated animators. Uh, we've got a lot of respect for the craft, but it's just not us. So. We didn't want to outsource that, we didn't want to do any rigging, we didn't do anything like that, and obviously for 2D, we didn't need to do any of that, so that was appealing. So once we'd all decided we're going to do this 2D game, uh, it was time for the artist to bring us some, some influences, things that we were going to use to sort of decide exactly what we meant by 2D pixel art game, because despite it being a commonly used phrase, it means different things to different people. And the first game they brought to my attention is this game that I'd never heard of. Uh, this is Batman on the NES. Now, there's some really important things to notice about this, uh, namely the incredibly limited color palette. And obviously there's a small amount of pixels on the screen as well. There's, this is a great example of doing a lot with very little. I mean, it's almost impressionistic. If you look at Batman there, he's about three colors. Those buildings, again, two or three colors. Now, the thing that's really important to us here, if you look at that building in the background, seeing how it's faded from fully lit to fully shadowed in just a couple of pixels, uh, to that dark space that's really important because your mind's filling in the blanks there they're not having to generate all that detail not only could they not generate it but also it would look better even if they could right and linked to that just look at all that black space almost a quarter of the almost a quarter of the screen is just completely black and you know there's a certain kind of bravery to do that to know that you're you know what you're doing as an artist if you're able to do that because you've done it for a reason it's not happened accidentally 
This is you working sensibly within the limitations of your engine, uh, not just because you don't know what to do. Now this links nicely to the next game, Zelda, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Now if you see in that previous Batman shot, there were loads of just areas of pure black. Here, just take a look at the grass and the, uh, the water there. It's not a really noisy set of uh, tiles, it's just a pure color. Now this looks great, not only because just you know it's fantastic strong art direction but also it gives the player player's eye somewhere to rest if you look at that bridge there it's not noisy but it's noisier imagine if the whole screen looked that way that would be a bit busy uh and now but you can just you know glance up at the grass and so on and that's nice so that's something we really wanted to pull across into our game and finally you can't talk about pixel art without talking about metal slide can you so now the, the things we really took from this is really it's obscenely high quality bar now we're never going to reach this quality these guys were incredibly experienced and it was a huge dedicated team but there's nothing wrong with aspiring to that level of quality they never cut corners they never took shortcuts that's why it looks so fantastic and a little bit closer to home uh their character animations were really good reference for us the cheeky little bounce of all the characters was something we uh we took on board and you'll see that later so that are influences in terms of the pixel art style but in terms of our whole world how are we going to put that all together we needed a springboard for our style um now at this point in the project we had literally zero budget so we couldn't have our own concept art what we did is use a technique that i like to call stealing and we borrowed some concept art from uh, the ubisoft prince of persia games now this first shot here was a heavy inspiration for our uh, prison tile set you can see both in terms of the props and the color scheme. I mean, uh, those ladders, uh, those little portcullis doorways there, everything. It was fantastic. Um, and this one is pretty obvious. It's a big palace. We wanted big palaces. Um, but this was really good for helping us decide what actually makes a good looking palace. How do you actually break down these architectural features? Uh, so if you look here, you've got things like pillars the walkways, the fences, the banners, all of those things were useful for us. And again, the color scheme is pretty nice too. And finally, this is a shot we refer to quite often in the early days. Um, we've got a lot of instances where our tile sets, our palace or prison tile sets are interacting with, uh, with caves. And you've got lots of nice touches of how this is actually happening. Like see those stair that stairway there carved into the actual ground, the way it meets that doorway, the way you've got that second raised level, uh, it was all very handy. We had we had our idea of our influences, we had our idea of sort of our art style and direction. It was time to actually work out how to do this uh, in a game environment. So this is what the artists were able to do. Uh, this is all experimentation and Photoshop at this point. Now, this is a couple of months work. Uh, I want to stress the artists, they'd never done 2D before and they'd never done 2D pixel art. Um, so it was it's it's been a journey for them. I should point out as well that uh, there's many helpful tutorials as always but particularly helpful there's a bunch of tutorials by Derek Yu uh, I'll link to those when we put this these slides up online but I'm sure you better find it if you google it and also we had a few test animations now if you remember the uh, metal slug ones I mentioned earlier you can definitely see the influence there in the, the cheeky little bounce there it adds a huge amount same for this guard as well so we moved on from our pro from our photoshop prototype into game maker uh, we used Game Maker as it was free and it seemed like a pretty easy reach for something 2D. Um, but the goals here really were just to just get used to painting out the tile sets, see what things we were missing, you know, work out all the little pieces of the jigsaw that you really need and just sort of see how we feel about Game Maker and its tools. Uh, so you'll notice there's no, there's no real level design here. It's all just, let's just throw stuff in and see what happens. Uh, you can see that a lot of it already looks pretty good uh, and particularly in this shot here, you can see that, uh, that sort of Batman Nez influence where a lot of the screen here is just completely black but that that looks good uh, your mind can fill in the blanks and it sort of draws your eye into the middle to focus on that detail of where the player character is now following this uh, the development landscape had changed from when we started working on this game lots of engines that were previously completely out of reach or ridiculously expensive uh, that was no longer the case engines like Unreal had become uh, very very affordable obviously they're not technically free you're paying back in licensing but it's very approachable so it was time to really reevaluate what we had now and if that was going to give us everything we wanted in the future we came to the conclusion pretty quickly that game maker didn't really match our team and our experience 
Now, I want to stress there's absolutely nothing wrong with Game Maker. Lots of great games have been made with Game Maker. Um, I'm not going to list them all. It would be pointless, but it's not. It's not. It doesn't mean you can't make great games with it. The argument here was that our team had this huge amount of AAA experience and use of these sort of integrated pipelines, access to source code, that sort of thing. These are things that Game Maker doesn't support, and that's fine. But that would just be a huge amount of our expertise we'll be wasting. So what we did is we compared what experience we had to what engines were out there, and UE4 was the way to go for us. Now, why Unreal Engine specifically? Uh, this is also worth pointing out that these sort of things apply to all the big engines, but Unreal really dialed down for us. So both myself and the, and the artist were very familiar with Unreal. Uh, the artist, in fact, had worked professionally on a few Unreal titles in the past. I just dabbled around in my spare time making stupid maps for Unreal Tournament and the like. But along the way, I learned a lot about their scripting system and uh, you know their level design tools. So we all had a base degree of famili familiarity with the engine which was very important something else that was very important to us was they have a system called blueprint which is their visual scripting i don't know if anyone is familiar with kismet but this is basically the next generation of that you can do pretty much everything in blueprint things that used to be buried away in the c plus plus or unreal script are all there um, we bet pretty heavily on this because we believe that if the artist can understand how to make materials and other things in a similar editor then they're probably going to be able to understand the basic gameplay logic and you know uh, do some work for themselves in that area and that's going to free up code and that was very appealing for a small team and also we're taking a long-term view here we want to be a tech share with future product projects uh, be that a similar game to this or be something that's you know a more traditional AAA game, you know, advanced lighting, PBR, 3D, all these ridiculous post-process effects, essential, uh, etc. But there's still things we can bring across from this game, uh, dynamic music, si music systems, high-level AI, that sort of thing. Um, it would be a waste if we made it for this and then just had to throw it away. So we don't want to do that. And we're hoping with Unreal we don't have to. So, were we right? Did this work? Were we able to get anywhere? So yes, that worked. That was our first Unreal 4 engine build. So that was created in about two months using the tile map assets we had from Game Maker. Uh, once we'd made this, we decided we should take it out to GDC. Uh, our aims at GDC really were to just get a feel for what people thought of the game, if we had any potential going forward. And we knew Epic would be there, so we'd just sort of see if we could get any interest from them. Um, things went really well, way better than expected. We got a great response great response both from publishers and epic themselves uh, in particular with epic i had planned this sort of huge six month plus campaign of how i was going to try and get them to notice us and it turns out really i needn't have bothered because within a couple of days of us being at gdc uh, we'd had literally uh, both of the founders of the company here had turned up uh, in, and it was great to get tim sweeney over particularly because my coding mate uh, was convinced we'd never be able to do it so uh, i bring this up really not entirely just to show off, I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty proud of it, but also because even though it's not the focus of this talk, it's worth considering when you're picking your engine, what kind of support you might be able to get externally, like uh, what, what support are the engine manufacturers going to give to you? It's in their interest to help you. I mean, from this thing from Epic, on the back of that, we've managed to secure a development grant from them, and also they've been gracious enough to give us some space on their stand at develop here. So things like that are worth thinking about. They're part of your whole decision about picking an engine. So what were our early discoveries uh, from that two month period working on the game? So everything is based around the Paper 2D plugin, uh, which handles all the sort of tile maps and 2D features you'd expect. Now, while it is a plugin, it's an official plugin. People at Epic actually made this. Unfortunately, it's not quite finished yet. And those guys are very busy on other Epic projects. So, uh, you know, it's a bit of a struggle there. Uh, when I say it requires code support, I mean proper, full-on uh, C++, let's dive into the source code kind of code support. Lots of things did work, but when things didn't, 
I'll be honest, myself and the artist couldn't solve it. We need to get some support. And we do have it, but obviously any time that has to be spent on this is time that can't be spent uh, making our brand new features. But saying that, th this pipeline worked pretty well. Uh, all integrated tools, all part of the engine, all pretty robust despite missing features, and everyone was able to chip in all the time. And I'm going to say this lots of times, but that's a huge win for us. It's only five of us. Efficiency is key. So we were all able to do something without tripping over each other. It made sense. And uh, the biggest surprise really is that lighting just worked and it also looked great. So here's our unlit shot. This is how it would have been in Game Maker had we have continued. And here it is lit. Now admittedly, this shot is fairly subtle, but I hope between this and the video you saw earlier that the effects of the lighting are quite pronounced. Uh, it works, it basically it works very well. It works in harmony with our, with the way we've made the tile maps. Again, you've got those black areas there and that works alongside the actual lighting to really add a lot of depth to the scene. Um, the Game Maker, while the sort of Game Maker version would be arguably the most pure version of the pixel art, it could tend to look a little washed out and obviously limits our options going forward. But this looked great. This, this just worked and we were so pleased with the way it looked. But then it was time to take a step back because it would be very easy to get carried away here. Uh, suddenly we've got access to all these ridiculous AAA effects. And you know what? The first one we used let's, looked great. So let's use all of them. Let's go for normal mapping. Let's go for depth of field. Let's go mental. No, we can't do that. So what we wanted to do is just form a lens that we can use to evaluate all of these tools and decide if we're going to use them. Uh, the way I formed this lens was that of, to call it basically, is this game going to look authentic? Uh, a lovely thing to say, but what do I actually mean when I say that? Well, what I mean is, what we're aiming to do is evoke that memory of a classic rather than completely recreate that. Uh, when I say that, I'm saying, if you guys think of, say, Super Metroid or Castlevania in your head, now, unless you've played them recently, probably the way they look in your head isn't the way they actually look. Sure, the pixel art's still great, but the sort of other effects and other things are probably not aged as well. So what we're trying to do is make that game that's in your head rather than what actually exists. Uh, another way of putting that is to basically take these contemporary effects and use them without compromising the sort of classic aesthetics that actually made that game what it is. So again, lovely words. How do we actually implement this? Well, what we did is we'll pick some core limitations that actually define that style. What could they absolutely not do uh, back in the day when they were making these games? And you know, those limitations became the strengths that they work to. That's what defines those games. So let's probably not mess with those. And then on top of that, let's just evaluate the new features we've got that don't compromise these first set of rules and apply them where it makes sense. And let's see where we get on. The so firstly, the limitations. These are quite straightforward. Uh, we want to stay, to stay true to those classic limitations for the pixels that we just discussed, which means pixels can't do things like this. They can't skew. They can't rotate, they cannot be scaled, and we've always got to maintain that one-to-one -one resolution of the pixels. They don't end up being scaled up or down to funny sizes. Likewise, uh, we're going to be we're going to use restraint in some areas. We're not going to go crazy with transparency or gradients, even though obviously it's effortless to do so. Likewise with the color palette. Now, a lot of these classic games probably had four shades per color. Uh, obviously, we aren't restricted by that. We could use millions of colors, but we're still going to use a small palette, just not quite as small as those classic games. And finally, no motion tweening in our animation. Uh, the best way I can think to describe this is if any of you are familiar with a 2D game called Mark of the Ninja. Now Mark of the Ninja has a sort of uh, flash style of animation to it. And so uh, the main character, the ninja, when you're flying around the levels, he's almost like this amorphous blob with limbs popping out at the correct points. And it looks fantastic for them. But that but again, that's a thing that classic pixels cannot do. So we're not going to do that. It's all going to be hand keyed animation. Uh, as the artist colorfully put it, don't mess with the pixels. We have a few little golden rules here that we're using to decide, uh, that will help us decide if we can use these modern effects that exist or not. Really, you should always be able to count the pixels on the screen. We shouldn't be doing any crazy blurring of the whole screen or mass distortion because then really you're, you're just moving too far away from what the actual appeal of pixel art is. Uh, and reiterating, nothing should ever break that one-to-one -one pixel ratio. Uh, I mean, that means you, you shouldn't really have any, you shouldn't have rectangular pixels. You shouldn't be skewing or crunching them. A, a pixel is square and it should always be square. Now, 
We do squeeze these rules a little bit in the following examples, and I'll show you why and hopefully try and justify why we think it works out okay. We've got an example here of mist. Now, admittedly, this one's quite subtle. I hope you can all see that. Now, the, the mist is a combination of two pretty simple effects uh, for a modern engine. Uh, so there's a post-process volume that adds color adjustments to the scene, and that's combined with a tiled cloud texture that's just panning across the screen. Uh, now, why we think it's okay to use something like this in this example is that we want to have other ways to limit the play of visibility and add atmosphere to environments you might, you might visit several times. Uh, and if you look at the clouds there, they've still got that pixel style to them, so we don't feel we're, we're drifting too far away from our standards. This is another one here where we're using lookup tables uh, to put different color schemes on the player character. And we're just using a radius check from our light sources, and either you're in the light or you're out of the light, and those uh, use these tables. Now, we don't feel we're breaking the rules here because we're not skewing the pix we're not skewing the pixels, we're not messing with them, we're just using a different set of colors. Again, not possible in the classic age, but something we can do. Um, but why do we do this? Well, we want to have a minimal HUD. Uh, we don't want to spend all this time drawing these lovely pixels and then obscure it with HUD. So we're hoping that this here is going to be your primary indicator for being able to know if you're visible or not. Uh, if you're using that one lot there, you're visible. And if you're using the other lookup table, you're invisible. And finally, particles. So this was another freebie, really. I'll just chuck those guys on. Uh, the particles are just out of the box, Unreal Engine particles. Uh, the thing that's slightly more complicated is you can see there's that distortion effect there, where clearly we are breaking our classic rules there. Um, now, we'd originally intended to do this using uh, a refraction system, which you can do pretty effortlessly in 3D. But sadly, that doesn't work with our orthographic camera. Uh, what we had to do here was actually distort the scene UVs uh, and give yourself a similar effect. Now, I bring this up as an example of how uh, something didn't work out immediately for us. Many things were just easy wins, but in this case, we actually had to uh, take a different route to get to our solution. But it's just to point out that, hey, you know what? You're going to get a lot of gains using these engines in uh, less conventional manners, but you're still going to bump up into problems. So keep that in mind. But why did we actually bother with these torches? Well, it's a stealth game. Uh, there's going to be lots of time you're in the dark. So these torches are going to be around a lot. So we should try and make them look as interesting as possible. And I think we've succeeded there. So just to wrap up on that section, uh, we believe that we've made something that looks authentic. Uh, we're, you know, we're mixing effects that certainly didn't exist at the time, but we believe we're doing it in a style that matches what they would have done. Uh, from most of the feedback we get, I believe we're succeeding there. So I think, I think it can be done and we're happy with what we've got there. Uh, as you saw, uh, the, the easiest win for us was lighting. We got a huge amount of depth from pretty much just flicking a switch. Uh, completely unexpected. Well, at least to me, maybe, maybe the artist kind of knew it was going to happen, but the 2D sprites lighting in this way, it just worked. I think a lot of people think we're doing something a lot smarter there, a lot more unusual or labor intensive, but we're really not. It's great. And thankfully, uh, our earlier gamble had sort of paid off here. These tools, um, all those effects I just showed you, the artists were able to implement those themselves, uh, right from setting up all the materials and the effects to actually making a gameplay object that exists in the game. They need a little bit of help to make it performant by the uh, by the coders, but it was still done in the visual scripting language of Blueprint, and everyone chipped in there. So that's fantastic. So now we're starting to build up our art style. We're building up our assets. How do we actually build a world? So again, we're back into Paper 2D, and we're back into their tile map editor. That was the universal tool that we all used to do that. Um, it was everyone's focus, basically. We're all We're all in that world. Uh, now, the time app editor itself, uh, as we were saying earlier, with regards to code support, it was lacking some sort of time-saving functionality that we really could have done with. Um, and the most notable is that you can't really uh, resize an existing tile map. If you don't make it the right size the first time, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And before we really had a handle on how big our environment should be, we did end up losing a lot of time there. So what are our tile maps like? Um, they're pretty standard, but let's just go over a few things. So each of our tiles is 32 pixels. Now, in many of these classic games, like we showed earlier, uh, they'd be 16 by 16 pixels. And this is one of these areas where we don't feel we need to be constrained by that. Uh, we can make them bigger. And crucially, we're still sticking to our rules. We're not skewing anything. We're not messing with anything. 
They're just bigger because you know what? Modern machines have quite a bit more memory than these classic devices. We can handle that. Uh, something the artists were insistent upon is that even though these days, hey, you can go a bit freeform, place things anywhere, everything's got to stick to the grid. Just don't go off the grid. I think that's good general advice, but it's always tempting, particularly in these kind of games. The one exception to this, because there's always an exception, is that for little detail placement, uh, the actual grid upon the tile map was set to 16 by 16. Um, that's mostly used for little bits of foliage and things like that and props. Uh, here's a good example of why having that uh, smaller pixel grid was useful. So if you see here, a number of props there, like these, uh, like the, well, the things in front of you there. I know, I'm not even sure what all of these are, to be honest. I should probably take a closer look. But you can see at the moment, they all align perfectly with the pillars. Uh, they don't look bad, but it feels a bit artificial. And then if we have this ability there to move them and layer them differently because they can be in different positions, it just looks that bit more organic. And again, it's one of those subtle things that probably a lot of uh, pixel art games don't pick up on or add, but this is a kind of cumulative thing that will make your game just look a lot better without making without destroying any classic pixel elements. So I alluded there to the number of layers we've got in the game. Let's go and break it down. So this is a thing I spend all of my day looking at, and all the designers in the room, I hope there are some, uh, this will feel comforting. This is a white box. It's hideous. It's ugly. Uh, it's exactly what I want. Um, Internally, we've started referring to these as ice palaces due to the color scheme. Uh, they work, right? I don't get attached to them. If I think something doesn't isn't fun, I just delete it. I don't have any concerns about any of the art stuff. However, once these are locked down, they get handed on to art, who paints on top of this in different layers. They never use this layer directly. So firstly, we've got all the foreground layers. Um, there's three layers here, uh, one of which is, only one is the layer that the player is actually walking on. It's the one that does generate all of the collision uh, and following that you've got the obviously named background layers uh, hopefully you can all see that okay now yeah they're pretty straightforward There's, it handles the background and a few other elements uh, again it's three layers and finally what we've got is the foreground layers uh, sorry the gameplay layers and there's and there's a couple of those as well uh, this is where we house things like ladders columns and stairs and also you can see that that moss on the the steps and stuff is uh is lovely and just put on that layer as well. So once that happens, that's when we put everything into a standard Unreal level file. We do this because we can add all these entities that we want. We can add the lighting, we can add the particles, all the animated sprites, all of our post process, and all of our gameplay entities, the most obvious of which being, excuse me, uh, being the AI. And uh, this is what it looks like. It's also a good opportunity to see that, you know, obviously it is literally a 3D environment. Those lights do have volumes and you can, you might, if you squint, just better see some of our big box volumes for post-process and other things like that. Um, you can see that once the lighting gets baked in, it makes a huge difference to the scene. So what are our conclusions on that pipeline? How's it going for us so far? Well, uh, this is one of the many places we were wrong. Uh, building these 2D environments was easily as time consuming as 3D. Um, we had a general learning curve of what 2D actually means when you're working on it. You know, we made a lot of mistakes in the early days. Uh, there's a learning curve with the 2D tools as well. And as I covered there a few times, they were just unexpected things that just didn't work in 2D for various reasons. Uh, unknown unknowns, I suppose. So in general, we didn't save any time there. I think if we started again from now, we would. Uh, we would save some time, but it didn't happen this time. However, the time map editor, uh, limitations uh, aside, was very intuitive. Uh, it worked the same way as everything else does in Unreal, so we we're all up to speed pretty quickly. Um, and we can drag things in and out of it and manipulate it with all the other editors. So that was fantastic. And alongside the visual scripting and everyone being able to chip in, also by the nature of uh, having the separate tile maps and then throwing them into a level, we rarely blocked each other, which again is super important. If one person is blocked, that's a fifth of the team. So it was great that that didn't really happen. We didn't have to even really think about that too much. So as I said there, uh, some of our assumptions didn't really come true and some did. So let's just, let me just evaluate those for you. So was 2D easier than 3D? No. Oh God, no, it really wasn't. Um, once we'd settled on this sort of uh, idea of authentic 2D, there are very few shortcuts. Uh, if you think of all those rules I applied there, they all mean that some tasks you might think are simple are gonna take a lot longer. 
And I guarantee any pixel art game you've seen that you can't put your finger on why it looks a little bit ropey, it's probably broken some or all of these rules. Uh, we, we couldn't do that. We didn't do that. So there were few shortcuts. It meant everything was quite time consuming. And likewise, uh, it requires real understanding of uh, the light and shape and form of these objects. Um, the artists sometimes jokingly referred to themselves as uh, digital photocopiers when making 3D props. Within reason, I mean, there's still an artistic component, obviously, but you can just kind of make those without really understanding how they work in an artistic sense. That's not possible in 2D because you've got to, you've got to interpret the lighting and the shape, as I've said, and you've got to impart that onto a very small number of pixels. That takes a lot of time. Uh, that takes multiple attempts. So yes, not easy, I guess, in conclusion. And another thing that was not easy was animation. Sure, we didn't need to rig anything, uh, which was an advantage, but it's very time consuming and it's very inflexible. Uh, if we made an animation that we liked, but then we decided, oh, wouldn't it be great if they were holding this object? Or wouldn't it be great if it just did this thing at this point? That's not a case of, oh, I'll just throw in a few more keyframes or, oh, I'll just attach that object. It's like pretty much start again. So yes, lots of starting again, which obviously uh, does not make things easy. Uh, were we right to use a feature heavy engine like Unreal Engine 4? I think so. Uh, this allowed us to leverage all of our existing AAA experience. And by that, I mean uh, the robustness of the tools, the range of the features, access to source code, uh, things we didn't, you know, things that we were used to having that we would lose if we went somewhere else. And also very important to us is just a huge amount of technology available. Again, this applies to any of these feature heavy engines. Uh, there were things we didn't even know we needed that were just waiting for us. Uh, the, the visual scripting, uh, for example, going outside of art in the AI, all of the behavior trees, we never would have written that for ourselves, but it's fantastic. Um, and the amount of time put into all these tools is, is huge. They pretty much all work the same and they all, they're all, you know, consistent look and feel. Not only would we have not had time to create these things, but, uh, you know, we never could have justified the time. It just means that anytime you want to try something, you just can. Uh, I mean, for example, we decided to try normal maps. Didn't like them, but you know what? Didn't waste much time on it. Uh, the same with a bunch of lighting effects we wanted to try. It's, a, it's incredibly low risk for trying new things. If we were making them ourselves, the risk for everything is huge, right? If you spend a month working on something and you don't like it, you've wasted a lot of time. So that never came up. And as I said, the visual scripting was a huge win for us. Everyone has put some code into this game. Maybe only a little bit here and there, maybe even a simple object. And of course, you know, the coders have probably changed every single bit, but Everyone's put something in, and that's great between the five of us. Uh, the visual scripting uh, blueprint has become a kind of common tongue between all disciplines, and I've personally never experienced that before, so it's fantastic. So just to sum up our experiences as independent developers working on these kind of things so far, I think what's really important is that you pick the tools uh, that fit your team rather than getting your team to work around the tools that you've decided for some other reason. In our particular case, could we have found an engine or a, you know, a pipeline that was a faster path to getting a 2D game like this working at a basic level? Yeah, sure. I'm sure we could have done. However, was there another engine out there that would allow us to sort of use all our existing AAA experience and also allow us to grow and expand over time for other projects? I don't think so. Um, it's been a long-term investment, uh, but the thing is it's starting to pay off. And I think that's what you've got to think about. Um, as much as people don't like to talk about it, you know, you have to have thoughts of games ahead of the one you're working on and you've got to think how you're going to survive. This is part of our plan. You're not just making one game, you know, you're planning a career in making games. So yeah, you know, you're, you're still going to have the same team between the same games, between different games. So it's worth locking that down. And also very closely linked to this. Um, Think very hard while you're limiting your options. I don't think you should ever do that and always go for the best tools. And by that, I mean these these uh, these feature-heavy engines. Uh, I mean, again, going to our specific example, Unreal Engine does loads of stuff we don't need. You could, you know, comfortably write several books about the things in there we don't need. But because it has all these functionality and because it has to be to support all of these things, it's very robust and that does benefit us. And if we want to throw in something a bit from left field, there's probably already an entire system in there for us. That, is, that has a huge amount of value 
and yes you know in terms of royalty uh, in terms of licensing stuff you're going to get you're going to pay for it we think it's easily worth it um there's no prize for using the leanest engine you can get your hands on no one's impressed really when it comes to somebody who's actually playing the game you know how close to the metal you were i think you need a very strong case not to go for this those cases do exist but i think you need to think about it a lot harder than people do and I also feel that, uh, you know, modern effects uh, can work with retro games. Uh, you know, don't rule out all these modern effects without trying them. Uh, I think what's important to us is that you have a lens within which to decide which ones you're going to use and which ones you're not. So uh, make sure you've got something like that, but you can make it work. Just have some, have some core values and stick to them. Now the sticking to them, that's the hard part as, as hopefully you've got some idea, but you can make it work. So give it a go. And uh, a sort of wider point here that using these industry industry leading tools has really, you know, improved our game massively and our productivity, um, and also really our quality of life. Uh, something for me personally here is that uh, f after leaving AAA, I was determined to work fewer hours per week and still, you know, make the same meaningful contribution. Now I've been able to do that uh, pretty comfortably, in my opinion. Now, I mean, that's down to the fact we've got these robust pipelines, we've got these editor tools that we'd never have time to make ourselves. Uh, the visual scripting, obviously, uh, it comes back to that old phrase of we've been able to work smarter, not harder. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all, we all want to make games, but we shouldn't destroy ourselves making games. And I feel quite strongly about that. And uh, just one more thing, just to uh, Columbo you guys here. This button really doesn't exist. Trust me, we spent a long time looking at it, so there's just no such thing as the make good button. Now, the, the art we have in the game here, as hopefully I've shown you during the course of this talk, is the result of hard work and having uh, a strong art direction and not taking shortcuts. Um, when people have occasionally asked us, like, oh, you know, are you using this particular effect? It seems like they're digging to sort of find a specific trick we used. Uh, the equivalent to me is uh, asking a photographer, oh, wow, that's an amazing photo. What camera did you use? The camera's really not important. It's the person behind the camera who knows how to use all that functionality and has correctly applied it. That's what's made that beautiful image. And likewise, that's what's made this beautiful game. Uh, I can say that because I didn't do the art whatsoever. Now, uh, I, s I don't say that it's incredibly hard work to discourage you. Quite the opposite, right? These days, um, it's never been easier. There's no arcane knowledge required. You don't have to speak to a guy who knows a guy who has a book somewhere that tells you how to make this one feature work. You know, there's nothing separating you from the big boys in terms of um, cool effects you can do or engines or languages or anything like that. Uh, and so, yeah, these techniques have never been more approachable than they are. Uh, they are now. I mean, there's engines like Unity, CryEngine, Lumberyard, obviously Unreal. Uh, they're out there and you can try them for free you know there's a huge wealth of information available as well uh you know the idea of open development is quite a thing these days there's development blogs twitch of course we do twitch as well but it's never been more approachable um there's no reason not to do it hard work is always going to be required but anyone can work hard um if you want to so go out there and do it please so that brings me to the end of the talk thank you for listening if you've got any further questions, feel free to reach out via Twitter or email or check out our website, siegeandsandfox.com.